I've been writing software for well over 40 years. So what lessons have I learned during that time? What things do I think made me the programmer that I am, whatever that is? That's our topic for today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, welcome and please do consider subscribing. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. This is inevitably a story of a personal journey of discovery. My journey of discovery. One that's taken me from a hobbyist playing in my bedroom with my computer to a career in software development spent mostly at the more complicated end of the spectrum. My first real exposure to a computer was when my then girlfriend, now wife, came home from her parents with a Sinclair ZX81, 1K computer. The computer that her university lecturer father had brought home for the holidays. She taught me my first program in BASIC to count displaying the numbers on the screen. This was one step up from, in complexity from Hello World, but I was already hooked. By the following week, I'd learnt enough to write an exceedingly simple version of Space Invaders, with a single invader represented by an X and a defending spaceship represented by a W with full stops for missiles. By now, I was seriously hooked. So my first lesson was really the pleasure that I had found in manipulating this tiny simple world inside a computer. I quickly got to the point where I found BASIC much too slow to write even the simple games that I wanted to create. So I started to learn how to program in Z80 assembly language. This is how I learned a lot more about how a computer actually worked, as well as liberating my ability to write what seemed at the time to be astoundingly fast programs, drawing whole screens during the refresh cycle of the video circuitry in my computer. So lesson two was about learning how to understand enough about how everything worked to take advantage of it. This lesson came back in, into importance a long time later, but we'll get to that. But in those days, it was pretty obvious stuff and nothing unusual. Most hobbyists of that era would have had a very similar experience to me. The home computers of the day, at least the ones that I could afford, were so basic that you had to understand them in some depth to do anything even slightly interesting or useful. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We are extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts and Transfic. Equal Experts is a multinational consultancy built on applying the ideas and techniques that we talk about here to build great software for their clients. Transfic is a financial technology company applying advanced continuous delivery techniques to deliver low latency trade routing services to some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. These companies offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and in software engineering, click on the links in the description below and do check them out. If you'd like to learn more about how to apply some of the lessons that I discuss in this episode and how to apply them to your software development, then take a look at our training courses. If you buy before the end of this month, you'll be able to take advantage of our summer sale and get a 20% discount off any course on the site. Going back to my story, there was no publicly available internet at this time. So our learning was based on talking with similarly obsessed friends and avidly reading magazines on the topic. One of my favorite magazines at the time here in the UK was a magazine called Your Computer. Your Computer was amongst other things filled with program listings programs for all sorts of things that you could type into your computer to get the program working. One in particular left a very deep and lasting impression on me and my programming. It was a listing in a BBC Basic for the board game Reversi or Othello. I'd borrowed a friend's much more expensive computer and much better computer and was using this as a way of thanking him. I was going to leave him with a copy of the game as well as a way of finding my way around this new to me computer. Most of the code listings in your computer were, to be honest, a mess. When you made a mistake typing in this code, and you always made a mistake, finding the problem was horrible, laborious, painstaking. Often we resorted to rereading the listings character by character just to make sure that our transcription was good enough, and then we'd find the mistake. This code, though, was completely different to that. 
as I was typing it in, as I read it, it was clear to me what was going on. Mostly, it was crystal clear and easy to understand. I didn't know at that time that you could write code like that. This was a revelation to me. And I made a promise to myself to try to always write code that was as clear as that from now on. I didn't always manage it, but this code had a huge impact on my coding style, and I think it still does. Very sadly, I don't know the name of the programmer that I learned such a valuable lesson from, but his code was a work of art. And if you're out there, whoever you are, I thank you for teaching me such an enormously valuable lesson so early on in my life as a programmer. Tidy, readable code that's simple enough to be easily understood, well-structured enough to be easy to change and complex enough to accurately solve the problem, whatever that is, for me at least, defines what good programming is all about and has done from that day onwards. I moved on from basic and assembler to C and assembler and spent several productive years building increasingly complicated software and got my first full-time professional programming job during this time. I was also a fairly early adopter of C++ and although quite confused by it at first, I came to love it and appreciate how it enhanced my ability to solve much more complicated problems. Learning object orientation was another big step for me, making me appreciate that there was more to programming than only the code. It was a lot more about the shapes that we paint with our code than the code itself really. I was amazed how a well-designed object-oriented program seemed to have so little logic compared to what I was doing at that time. Code that I'd have to write myself in C or BASIC would seemingly vanish completely and only exist in the connections and relationships between the pieces of my object-oriented code. This was another big step in the direction of simplification for me. Around this time, I got very interested in the kinds of software that makes computers easy to use, operating systems, languages, device drivers, and other forms of systems software. My reasonably detailed knowledge of how the computers actually worked helped me to get jobs in computer manufacturers, and I ended up working for an innovative British computer company called Apricot. Yes, I know it was a clone of Apple. <laughs> We designed and built everything, whole computers, motherboards, BIOSes, device drivers, applications, and so on. So I got to work on everything from low-level firmware written in Intel Assembler through operating systems and device drivers to some early microcomputer-based distributed systems written in C++. So I was bouncing between very low-level systems programming and custom distributed Windows applications. This was before there was any real support for distributed applications like these on PCs. I learned a lot in this period, but with hindsight, three things that were very important to the rest of my career. Computers were getting a lot more complicated, and assembler was a niche that I didn't want to get stuck in. Much as I enjoyed assembly language programming, the importance and the risks of abstraction mattered we had to abstract to solve more complex problems. But abstractions could also easily hide important details, so you needed to be careful that you found the good abstractions. I also learned that distributed programming added whole new layers of complexity onto programming. Let me explain. I was at Apricot when the Intel 486 processor was launched. And as usual, we were the first PC manufacturer to market with that new processor with a new motherboard that supported it. This was a big step up from the 386 that had gone before it, but it was also a big step in performance and complexity. The 486 was the first processor to implement something called instruction pipelining, which organized your assembly language instructions so that they could sometimes run in parallel, in separate pipelines, terminology that I'd remember and return to later in my career. The trouble was that if you made a mistake in your code, the code would work fine, but with terrible performance because the code couldn't be pipelined. It was at this stage that I learned that I didn't want to program in an assembly language anymore. I was being forced to remember too much intricate, obscure detail to do a good job, and that wasn't really fun programming for me. That felt more like the job of a compiler than a programmer. I'd much prefer my compiler to generate correct machine code from my instructions, abstracting the more detailed rules of instruction pipelining, rather than relying on me remembering them. Perhaps more importantly though, I learned a more general version of this lesson, that I wasn't going to be good a good programmer by remembering every last detail of everything. That wasn't what made me 
good at what I was doing. Software development is much more complicated than that. No one can know everything. So we need to compartmentalize and abstract our work so that we can make progress in one place without knowing every last detail of everything else in every other place. This wasn't about an about face for me though. I had started out as a low level systems programmer and was now changing focus. But I think that my understanding of how the underlying hardware and software worked helped me enormously and would go on to underpin how I thought about and designed software pretty much for the rest of my career and to this day. This tension between hiding detail and the danger of that detail leaking out in problematic ways is a general one for abstraction. On one hand, we need abstractions that help us to make sensible progress. And on the other, abstractions leak. And sometimes if we're oblivious to how the lower levels beneath our abstractions actually work, it's all too easy to run into big trouble. So how and where do we sensibly draw the lines? A little more on that later. The distributed systems that I got involved in at Apricot were when things like PC networks and even email were new. So this was quite novel stuff at the time. I built security systems for Apricot computers, and one of them was designed to deploy and configure security for networks of computers. Another of my early forays into distributed computing was a kind of forerunner of my later career. I worked on a system very close to infrastructure as code. I was tasked with helping the factory to do a better job of installing operating systems based on a customer's order. So I built a system that installed and configured operating systems for Apricot servers, Xenix, Windows, LAN Manager or NetWare, and it would do this automatically, inspecting and auditing the hardware to determine its configuration and then tailoring the installation to fit that new host. During this and subsequent jobs, notably for a company called Integrated Object Systems, developing systems level infrastructure for what we'd now call microservices, but at the time we described as cooperative business objects, I developed a very healthy respect for and interest in the complexities of truly distributed systems and an appreciation of message-based programming. Distributed systems are orders of magnitude more complex than single user systems. But messages, events, and asynchrony are important tools in taming that complexity. In my view, concurrency is to computing at quite a deep level and possibly for similar reasons analogous to quantum mechanics in physics. What is the state of a system that has multiple copies of the same data that's being changed in different places at the same time? This is a kind of superposition of state in the system as a whole. It was as a result of working on the Integrated Object Systems system called NUI, New World Infrastructure, that I got interested in PubSub style event based systems. I went on to design and build lots of systems like this over the years to come. This was very early in the mid 1990s, so I do need to get a move on if I'm going to cover the, the 40 years as I promised. Two more crucial learning points before we go though. At Integrated Object Systems, we ran a continuous build. That build just cycled all day, every day. As soon as the build finished, it started building again, whether there were new changes there or not. Everyone committed their changes to our homemade version control system on trunk. I added a handful of sanity checks in the form of smoke tests to verify that what we were actually building worked. So all of this added up to a very early crude form of continuous integration. A few years later, I worked on a project where we adopted full-blown extreme programming. But I confess, I didn't really get it until I saw JUnit a little while later. We were running automated functional tests in a crude form of, of continuous integration, but JUnit changed completely what I understood unit testing to mean. So much simpler than what I had understood before. Don't test that the code you wrote is the code that you wrote. Instead, verify that it does what it's meant to do. Test behavior, not implementation. A little while later, I worked at a company called ThoughtWorks, who were one of the pioneers, the first companies to adopt extreme programming for bigger software projects. Extreme programming was in those days seen by nearly everyone as a small team, small project approach. At ThoughtWorks, we helped to change that idea. I led a team of over 200 people, so we needed to innovate in testing, continuous integration, and in infrastructure as code to make all of this work. That innovation resulted in what later became known as continuous delivery, and the invention of a concept called the deployment pipeline. 
This was named after the instruction pipelining from the early Intel chips that I mentioned earlier. A deployment pipeline works the same as a branch prediction for Intel processors from the Pentium onwards. We get fast feedback from the commit stage of the pipeline and a high level of confidence that if all of those tests pass, then everything else will later. Once the commit stage is finished, we move on to work on the next thing. Meanwhile, we're making progress in parallel with the evaluation of all of our slower acceptance and other release defining tests that run in the pipeline. This is a simple but very effective parallel processing algorithm. One of the most revelatory points in my career came late. I was asked to join a new ambitious startup as head of software development. I was leading a team to build one of the world's fastest financial exchanges. This experience brought a lot of my learning from earlier in my career into sharper focus and combined it all together, including several things that I haven't talked about in this whistle stop tour. I've skipped over things about technical leadership, team organization for building complex systems and how to architect more resilient, more scalable systems. But maybe we can talk about that, those things on another day. But at Almax, the company that had hired me, we built this world beating financial exchange. This was the most complete application of the culmination of all of these ideas of continuous delivery that I'd experienced up to this point mostly because we were able to adopt and apply these ideas with no external constraints at all. No one telling us what to do or how to do things. No legacy of code, architecture, organizational structure or development culture. We molded all of these things to best fit the problems that we were trying to solve and to great success. We were successful in building great world-class technology, great development teams, a great long lasting development culture, it's still good today. And ultimately a very successful commercial organization. LMAX was valued at over a billion pounds a few years ago. And the development culture, as well as their technology, is still as strong and effective today as it was when we started over 15 years ago. I learned lots of valuable lessons at LMAX, but perhaps the most profound ones, again, reiterated things that I'd started learning much earlier in my career. Working in more effective ways is more important than our choice of tools or frameworks. And importantly, working in these ways is also a lot more fun. This was certainly a highlight of my career at LMAX, and nearly everyone who worked there I think would agree. At LMAX we refined and evolved ideas that had informed my approach to design for years, without me really understanding them fully. We came up with the idea of mechanical sympathy, understanding enough about how the systems and abstractions that our code was built on top of really worked so that we could abstract them sensibly without compromising the performance. Building software that went with the grain of the hardware so that we could maximize the advantage that we could take from it. We ended up achieving our initial goals and building a world beating high performance financial system. Taking a full blown engineering approach to software development pays off in terms of the efficiency with which we do work and the quality of the work that we can do. LMAX was both the highest quality system that I've ever worked on and the team was the most productive that I've ever seen. We genuinely built better software faster than anything else that I have ever seen. My book, Modern Software Engineering, was deeply informed by the lessons that I learned at LMAX, which were the culmination of much of my career. I hope that you find this skim over some of the lessons that I've learned interesting. Let us know about your major learning points in the comments below. And thank you very much for watching. Thanks too to our patrons who support this channel and our work on the channel. If you're interested in learning more and joining our Patreon community, there's links for that in the description below too. Thank you and bye bye.